There was a philosophy a college professor who asked his class a philosophical question, is this jar, which is full of rocks, is it full? And you, know the, you know the old uh, <clears throat> glass is half empty, half full. If I'd fill this halfway full of something, water per se, and ask you, is it half full, half empty? The, the optimist would say it's half full. And the pessimists of you would say it's half empty. So I ask you, is this jar full or not? How many of you say by show of hands it's full? Okay. You would be wrong. All right. <laughs> There's more room in here. I've got some pea gravel with me that I can, there's some space between those rocks that I can shake in here. Shake it all the way down. There. Now, all the spaces have been filled nearly the top. How many of you would say now this jar is full of rocks? Show of hands. Oh, you would be wrong. All right. <laughs> Got some tiny rocks, otherwise known as sand. Pour that sand in and get in every little crack and crevice. I've already given a small cash bonus to our janitorial staff, so don't worry about the. <laughs> all right. Get all the way to the top. All right, pack it in. All right. If we had 40 minutes, I could really get it in there tight, but let's just assume. Every ounce of air now is consumed all the way at the top. Now by a show of hands, who would now finally say this is full? Very good. Get those hands up. Yep. You would be wrong. All right. There's still a little more room for water. Actually, quite a bit more room. Take a second, we'll get it completely full. Nobody had brunch plans, did you? <laughs> All right, it's coming to the top. It's right to the brim. And I'm going to let it go just over the brim for this illustration. Here it comes over the sides onto the table, those you can't see in the back. How many of you now would say this jar is full? If you didn't raise your problem, we need to talk afterwards, OK? <laughs> There is no more room here. It is a, a finite vessel, just like you. You only have so much space in your life. And the college professor used this as an illustration, saying that if you're not careful what you put in the jar first, for example, if you don't put in the big rocks first, the most important things and priorities in your life, and you let it fill with water and sand and all this other junk, right? There's no room for it. Does that make sense? Say yes. yes. So for the Apostle Paul, in the letter to the Romans that Marissa read for us, Paul says the big rocks in your life is really consists of one thing, and that's your relationship with God. That's it. He said, for all the father of our Judeo-Christian religion, Abraham, did, and he followed all the laws, and there's a lot of them. There's a lot of rules. If you want to be into keeping the rules, there's a lot of things you can do to fill your calendar. Godly things. I looked it up. There's, you know how many laws there are in the Holy Bible from cover to cover? Take a guess. 900 Yeah. Some would say 10. There's 10 laws, 10 commandments. Some would say there's no, maybe a few hundred. There's 613 laws. 300 some that you're not supposed to do, 200 some that you're supposed to do. You would consume your whole life trying to do things to please God. And Paul said, we're not to do that. There's only one rule you need to keep, one big rock. And Abraham had it. It's faith in his heart that he believed in his God who created him. That was with him before he was a little tiny baby, before you were even born, a twinkle in your mother's eye. God was with you. God is with you every step of your journey, from baptism to beyond here, and for millions of years beyond your death. God will be with you at your one relationship. Now, we might also say some of our big rocks are, we might add our spouse, which I think is fair. Time with your spouse and attention, your immediate family, the kids, if they still live under your roof. If they don't, they're somebody else's problem, or should be. But, <laughs> right? Your spouse, your children, maybe your health are the big rocks. That's kind of it. 
those should go in first. And if we're honest with ourselves, how many of us are filling our lives, our vessels so full of water that we push these things to the margin? We say, oh, they'll understand. They're our family. They'll understand. Really? Really? And then the small pebbles, the smaller pebbles, are perhaps things that are important, your extended family, some of them, and then um, work, school, Hawkeye football. I mean, that's a big rock. I don't know. <laughs> right? Things that are important that we need to do for our own health and well-being. You need money. You need to work, right? But work isn't one of these. I think we're so tempted to fill our lives full of work, thinking, oh, I'm doing this. Our lie to ourselves is I'm doing this for my family to provide for them. Or we'll take a really nice vacation that you never get to or it just doesn't seem to satisfy because you've been filling your jar full of these guys. And then the sand, the sand is uh, things that are good, maybe our hobbies, things if we have time for. This is probably where Hawkeye football would be if I'm honest with myself. Uh, reading, whatever you do for fun to fill the time. And then the water, the water is all the other stuff that we hate doing. The tasks, the chores, things we do to just mindlessly fill up. Surfing Facebook, right? It's just watching television. It's just water. And I wonder how many of us, when we don't stop to think about it, that this is our life, is it not? This is our life, overflowing with water and sand. And we wonder where the time is for the things that matter. Well, this study, we're so serious about making room for God. I want you to pull out your bulletins, and you're going to have a small card in there. I want you to take it out. It's got a stop sign on it, and it says, three things I would love to stop doing immediately. We're going to take a minute right now in the uh, sermon for you to fill this out. Grab a pew pencil or a pen from your purse. If, if you only have one of these in a bulletin, there's two of you. Just write on your bulletin or a scratch piece of paper. I want every single person here to do this, please. And if you're watching us on video on Facebook or YouTube, take a moment now, right now, and scratch down a few items that you could think about. Maybe it's a, a volunteer activity, it's just too much. And in a perfect world, if you had no repercussions, and you could wave a magic wand, and you were in charge, and you could make it go away, what would be number one? Oh, I would love to stop doing this tomorrow, or two and three. And I'm not going to ask you to share this with anybody, me or anybody else. This is between you and God, so be honest. No one else has to see it or be ashamed, right? Oh, I would love to stop this. Maybe it's an attribute about yourself. I would love to stop blaming myself for that thing, finally. Or it might be, um, I wrote when we did this with our guy squad a week ago as kind of a practice run, I put down number one, I would like to stop trying to be so short-tempered with my kids. You know, they get crazy, and then I yell at them, and I'm like, why am I doing this? They're children. And so I've noticed in the past week, not doing, being so short-tempered, I've noticed a change in me. It's been good for me. Of course it's been good for them. Their dad's not getting angry at them. But it's been good for me. So what's something that you, in a perfect world, if you could stop doing, stop tomorrow? Well, let's take a minute right now, and let's write something down.
hopefully everybody had a chance to at least write one thing down that you could like to stop doing. I, as I said, I, I'm not going to ask you to share these. I, I don't want to know about them. But here's my challenge to you. I would encourage you to pick something off this list and stop doing it immediately. Make a, write an email today when you get home from work. Right? Have that tough conversation with somebody. Honey, I think I'd like you to try to do some of this task or we need a, maybe a part-time house cleaner or some, finally someone to do my taxes. I, it's not my... If, whatever it is, make a phone call tomorrow. You have 24 hours. Why do we give you 24 hours? Because all the research says if you don't act on one of these within the next 24 hours, you will never act on it. And you'll just keep on going our own life, busy as all heck, jar overflowing with water and sand, and nothing will ever change. But I encourage you to change. Because God wants this for you. God doesn't want your life just full of meaningless stuff. <clears throat> Jesus says that in today's gospel. So you work real hard and you spend all your time collecting rocks, right? At work, so you can have nice things. But what does it profit you if you get all the little rocks in the world, but you've lost your life? You've turned around at the end of your life and you've got nothing but small stones and sand. And no room for these people. I have to be frank with you, friends. I am so blessed as a pastor that I get to attend the most sacred spaces in your life. And one of them I cherish greatly is going to people at the end of their lives, usually in the hospital. And I ask these people, is there anything we can pray for? Any regrets you have? Any areas where you feel you need forgiveness? And to the person, not one of them has ever said to me, you know what? I wish I would have spent more time at work. Not a one. You know what it usually is? It's usually men. And they know they're on their deathbed. And they say, Pastor... I wish I would have spent more time on my faith. I wish I would have spent more time getting to know God. I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. If I had to do it over, I would have done that. I would have spent less time on the busyness and more time with what matters. Friends, this is your do-over. This is your future self coming to you and telling you now. This is your chance to reprioritize your life, to spend time on what truly matters, to make a little room for God. This is what God wants for you. This is what Christ prays for you. And it's my prayer for you as well. Amen.